before we get started again this morning, I see we got our young folks in here that want to see our great celebration from last Sunday. But I'd like to usher us into a time of prayer. I'll just give a word just before I step up here. And we, uh, uh, this is almost three weeks in a row we've had a, a emergency. Uh, don't know how major or minor it is. But we want to pray for whatever's going on out in the, uh, in the foyer. So let's let's join our hearts together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to just come to you, petition your throne right now, and know that you are in charge of everything, and whatever might be going on out in the foyer, in the parking lot, anywhere on this campus, Lord, you're in control. And we put our hope and our faith in you. We pray that you meet the physical needs, as well as we pray, Lord, that today you meet our spiritual needs, you draw us to you. And so we just trust you to meet each and every need in our lives. Amen. Well, uh, when I was in high school, I was probably about 17 or 18, I was given an assignment in my English class to write a term paper. And we were given various options as to what to write the paper on. And um, one of the, the characters that I was allowed to write a paper on was a man by the name of Billy Sunday. Anybody here know who Billy Sunday was? Your hands go up, yeah. Well, the, the Billy Sunday was a uh, an evangelist, a traveling preacher, uh, and this goes back to the early 1900s. And the very fact that I could write a, a term paper that's probably about eight to ten pages long, definitely the longest paper I've ever written at that point in my life. And uh, uh, I wrote it for a school English class. And the very fact that I could write a, a paper on a preacher in a public school setting in Memphis, Tennessee, was outstanding. Couldn't believe I was allowed to do so. But in my research of this man, this preacher, he was a part of the Sawdust Trail, a, a traveling tent revival of crusades. Billy Graham was saved during the Sawdust uh, Crusades. And uh, uh, Billy Sunday was one of those instrumental preachers that led up to that. Uh, he was also very instrumental in the prohibition that took place in America. A uh, great man of God, great dynamic preacher. Well, in my study, in the study on Bill Sunday and writing my paper, come to find out he had a background in baseball. He played professional baseball before he got into preaching. And he was very athletic. And he would do just uh, outrageous things uh, to make a, a point or an illustration. One of the things that he would do is he would stand on his head uh, as he was preaching. Uh, he would leap off the platform and, and do uh, somersaults. And, and it would really draw in and engage the crowd. And I remember as a 17-year-old or 18-year-old writing this term paper for my English class uh, in school, thinking I have never in my life seen a preacher do a headstand or a, a somersault or a cartwheel as a part of a sermon. Now, 25 years later, I've still never seen a preacher do anything like that before in my entire life. Until today. <laughs> Last Sunday, you, uh, you heard me say something that I, I might have said just kind of out of uh, a, a comical humor. Brother Jim came forward. He said, how many we had here? Our service last Sunday, and uh, he said, You need to get upstairs, you need to get up there and do a little jig. You need to run across the platform to celebrate uh, how many folks came for Easter Sunday. And I said, I can't dance, but I can do a carnival, will that be okay? And he said, Do it. <laughs> well, my challenge was for you that I wasn't going to do it last Sunday, but if you come back this Sunday, you'll see me do a carnival. You came. So here we go. <laughs> We had a 
that tremendous celebration service last Sunday, and I do want to celebrate that. And, and I shared that story about Billy Sunday and what he would do on the platform as he's preaching, because I'm sure there's some of you here thinking, how dare our preacher do that on the playing stage? I understand. I've never seen it before either. But folks, we can't sit our hands in the sour puss face when there's something to celebrate. We serve our risen Savior. And we can celebrate that very fact today. And here we are, we're, we're being live streamed. And uh, uh, Ricky's going to uh, edit it later and, and put the, the service on the internet. And we'll have hundreds, hundreds of people who will watch this. And I guarantee you, there'll be some people who say, I can't believe we just saw a preacher do a car deal on the stage. <laughs> Folks, I am here to tell you <coughs> the church does not need to be dead. Our worship does not need to be dead. We have something to celebrate. It is our risen King. And if one person who tuned in by live stream, or one person who's sitting here today, decides to give their life and keep to Jesus, then it was all worth it. And I'll do a hundred cartwheels if that's what it takes to bring people to Christ. Well, I do my exaggeration. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said that I would go, I would sacrifice my own life, and I would go to hell for all eternity if my brethren, my fellow Jews, would only come to Christ. Well, that's a, a bold statement to make. And he made that statement because he knew it's, it's impossible. That once he's saved, he's always saved. He cannot lose his salvation. And theologically speaking, he cannot spend eternity in hell. But that is how passionate he is in reaching people with the gospel to a saving God of Jesus Christ. And if doing a simple little cartwheel across the stage brings somebody to Christ, then I'll do it again. Well, I want us to look this morning in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. And I want us to look at the one thing that no one knows. Now, there's actually a lot of things that no one knows. No one knows what causes hiccups. Uh, we think we have some, some old wise tales that are rid of them, but they don't really work either. But no one really knows what causes hiccups. No one knows what really causes lightning bugs to light up. They just start doing it when it gets dark. No one really knows what foam is. Is foam a liquid? Is it a gas? Is it a solid? No one really knows. And I'm sure there's probably some brainiac out there who can give me an answer for all three of those questions and all the other things that baffle my mind because they're a whole lot smarter than I am. But even if there's somebody who come up with the answer, some scientific explanation of all these things and many others, there is still one thing that no one knows the answer to. It's found right here. In Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 36. If you have your Bibles open now in Matthew 24, I want to invite you to stand with me this morning if you're able to, out of the respect of the reading of God's Word. It says here in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Our Heavenly Father, we ask you pour out your Spirit upon us this morning and you bless the public reading of the Scripture this morning. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Last Sunday, as we celebrate our risen Savior, and we, we studied how there is proof, there is evidence that he walked out of the grave. There are the eyewitness accounts during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses to verify, who did not uh, dispute. And there's all kind of proof to prove that he is he walked alive after his crucifixion. Uh, we also 
study that, that there's, it means something to us. Because he lives, we live. But we ended last Sunday with the very fact that because he arose and he is alive forevermore, it also means that he is coming again. And so today, this morning, we're going to look at the very fact that he is coming again. In verse 36, it tells us that it is a day that is certain. It's a day that is certain. There is a certain day and a fixed hour for the judgment to come. And it's called the day of the Lord. Now, that will be after the great tribulation. That will occur when, uh, when, when everybody is to stand before the, the judgment seat. The great white throne. Those who are lost. That day is coming. But this, this passage also reveals to us there's a day when the church is raptured home. And it's all kind of tied in together with the, the rapture of the church, the seven-year tribulation, the second coming of Christ, and the beginning of the millennial reign. We don't know when the end times will occur. We don't know when it begins. We don't know this because it's not yet revealed to us. In Acts chapter 1, verse 7, it says, And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put into his own authority. There will come a time when God turns to his son and says, Go get my children. Go and bring them to me. Over in Zechariah chapter 14. Many verses here dealing with the, the end times account. Here in verse, or chapter 14, verse 1 of Zechariah, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. And your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the inner city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet Stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives was split in two, from east to west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it towards the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Hazel. Yes, you shall flee. I stood on that mountain. I stood there at the Mount of Olives overlooking the Temple Mount and between the, the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount where Jesus will, will uh, his feet will stand and this, this uh, earthquake will occur and it will split the ground in two and, and, and this great valley will occur right between where this occurs and the Temple Mount is hundreds upon hundreds of graves. These are Jewish men and women who have died and are buried right there because they are longing for the day as they read their Old Testament uh, text to tell us where this will occur. It's coming. The day is coming. It's certain of that. We continue on reading. Uh, the, this chapter goes on to let us know what was still yet to happen about the great earthquake. And uh, you can read that on your own. I encourage you to do so of uh, reading the, these uh, 21 verses here in Zechariah to let us know. The people have always tried to predict what is about to happen. We know it's certain. We know that it's there. We know that it's going to happen. And people have always tried to say, well, it's going to happen on this day, this time. I, I revealed to you uh, just a little while ago about a, a paper that I wrote in high school. Well, just a few years prior to that, I was in junior high school. And a man by the name of Edgar C. Weisenhart made a, uh, a prediction. He wrote a book. Now, I asked you who it suddenly was, and about half of you raised your hand. If I were to ask you who Edgar C. Weisenhart is, probably nobody would raise your hand. We've all forgotten about him. But he wrote a book. I guess he wrote it probably in 1987. It was published beginning of 1988. It was titled, 88 Reasons Christ is Coming in 1988. 
Yeah. And then I, I think it was sometime in September. It was right before my birthday. And uh, I was asking for a set of golf clubs for my parents when that was my birthday. My mom and dad said, well, why? There's no need to buy you golf clubs. Jesus is coming, so it's not going to happen anyway. <laughs> well, then his prediction obviously didn't turn out to be true, factual. He uh, made a, a, a second book. Probably the first book didn't sell enough, so he made a second book. Now, he had made a mistake. His calculations were all wrong. It was really going to happen in 1989. He was wrong again. <clears throat> Harold Camping said that Jesus was going to return May 21st, 2011. A man by the name of Tim Warner said that it would happen sometime between September 11th, 2029 to September 30th, 2036. He gives him a lot of leeway. <laughs> well, uh, I guess maybe a year or so ago, he, he's now made up a uh, correction to his statement. He says it's going to happen between 2020 to 2027. Still a, a seven year and what, about 20 day window? Uh, he, he's still got this, this wide range, but, but why? Why make predictions? Because not only do we read that there's a day that is certain, we also read in verses 39, 7 through 39, it is a day that will surprise. It's a day that will surprise. Now, probably most of us in here have been to a surprise party. Maybe you've had one thrown for you. Uh, I've had a few thrown for me in my life. Only one ever caught me by surprise. Only one that I've not figured out. But most of the time when we have a surprise party, you're able to put two and two together, aren't you? Most of the time. Now, again, you might have a really clever friend or family member who can really trick you, but most of the time, we're not surprised by surprise parties. And when Jesus came the first time, he did surprise a few. There were those shepherds in the field who were caught off guard. Uh, those who heard Mary's account that she was now pregnant and it was, it was from the God, that surprised them. Many did not believe. When he comes again, it will surprise everyone. When he came the first time, it was to say, when he comes again, it will be to judge. In Revelation 20, we read about the great white throne of judgment. And that, that judgment, when people stand before him, it will be a day <coughs> surprising. People will be caught off guard, not prepared to meet God Almighty. Why is that? It's because you go along with life. It says in verse 38 that people are eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, working in the field, grinding at the mill. Now, are all those, are those bad things? Well, maybe working in the field might be, but the rest of them aren't bad things. And, and Jesus even tells us that. Uh, Jesus tells us uh, that, that we, we can do these things. And he blessed marriage. And then in Paul, in his writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So our Bibles don't tell us that eating, drinking, and marriage, those are bad things. What they're just telling us here, these are common, everyday practices. These are things that we just go about in life. And we get busy. We get busy trying to put food on the table. We get busy trying to entertain our family. We get busy with life. You go about your daily life and, and think there are things that begin to pull you away from God. Maybe it's trying to earn more money and you're having to put in more time and work. Maybe it's your family obligations and, and you feel like you've got to be in every ball game. And your, your, your kids, your grandkids, they play travel ball and you've got to go and meet everything. And maybe it's, it's some family dynamic. But folks, there are things about life that are natural, things that, that take place. But if those things in life begin to take your eyes off of Jesus, then you're too busy. You've now got your priorities in the wrong place. Never take your eyes off of Christ. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. We are to fix our eyes upon Him. And that includes our worship. Now, we, we have a pretty good crowd here today. Not nearly the size crowd we had last Sunday for Easter. 
But it, it's a good crowd. I'm glad that God brought you here. Just think. If every single church member whose name is on the roll at Chestnut Grove, if they put a priority in worshiping and serving Him, this place will be full every single Sunday. Folks, we, have, we cannot take our eyes off the prize. We have got to put Jesus first in our lives. Yes, we have lives to live, and yes, we, there are things we've got to do, but don't become so busy that you take your priority off of Jesus. You may know people who are like this. You may be like this. And yes, you may be sitting here and go, well, my seat's getting mighty hot right now, preacher. That's good. I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you and convict you about your life and the fact that you need to be right with Him. Not only is it a day that's certain and a day that will surprise, but third, it's going to be a day that will separate. As we talk about this life that's so busy and it pulls us in so many directions, where will you be divided? Where will you be separated? It says in verses 40 through 41 that some believed and were, were taken off. Some believed and they exited. They met Jesus in the air. That's the rapture of the church. But what about after the tribulation? And we see the second coming of Christ. And those who do not believe, they will perish in their unbelief. You see, this separation. It will divide families. It will divide friends, co-workers, neighbors. <coughs> what will be the separation? It's whether Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. And I'm not asking you if you walk down some aisle at some point in your life. I'm not asking you if you repeated some prayer after somebody. I'm not asking you if you were dunked in a tank, in a church, or in a lake. I'm not asking you if you've got a thousand Bibles on your bookcase. I'm asking you, is Jesus Lord of your life? Is He the most important person, the most important thing, the most important anything in your life? That's what Lordship is. It's when we surrender to Him and make Him the most important person in our lives. If He's not, then you will be separated. You're going to be separated regardless. Folks, it is His desire to separate you and bring you to Him as His child. Not to separate you into an eternal torment. That is reserved for the devil and his demons. He did not create it for you because He loves you. He desires to have a relationship with you. You must come to Him. The good news is that you don't have to change. You don't have to, to, to say, I've got to clean up first. I, I, I've, got to, I've got to get rid of this area of my life. No, you can't do it. You cannot change your life. Only God can do it for, for you. I like it to, to this. If I'm walking my life, my way, doing what pleases me, what feels good, it's right in my own eyes, trying to please myself, trying to please others, whatever it is, I'm living my life. And I come to the realization I am living in my sin. I need Jesus. Now, the good news is He's right here. I don't have to run to Him. I don't have to travel to Him. I've got to turn to Him. And He's right there waiting with open arms. What is the day of separation? Today, where he tells us who are not his children to leave. But oh, for those of us who have turned to him and he's embraced us into his open arms, you are his child. And as he separates the wheat from the chaff, he will bring his children into his presence to be his child, to live with them forevermore. So, that leads us to our final point this morning. That is, it is a day to be prepared. Are you prepared for that day? Do you know Jesus? Does He know you? The answer to the second question is obvious. Yes, He knows you. He loves you. He died for you. He conquered death in the grave for you. And He's alive today for you. And He desires to have a relationship with you. 
But do you know Him? Do you know that saving grace? Have you experienced Him in your life? You see, this being prepared is more than just belief. The demons believe. The devil himself knows that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. That He died for sins. He rose again. The devil will be saved. The devil will be in heaven. The devil is not a child of God. He believed. Belief is only the beginning. Are you prepared when Jesus comes? Not only is this about having a relationship with Him, but as you become more like Christ, you are now prepared for the the the, the the rapture, you're prepared for the end times, and you're actually even desiring it. How many of you can say, I am so ready for all that to begin. I'm so ready for the rapture to occur. I'm so ready to meet my Savior in the air. I wonder. I wonder how prepared you are. Now I'm not saying you need to, to live your life looking up into the sky at all times. No, because then you'll have an accident while you're driving down the road. <laughs> but you need to have anticipation knowing that it could occur at any moment. That's what he tells us. It is a day that no one knows. Even the angels in heaven don't know. It could happen before we leave here this place this morning. <coughs> The word that's used here in our text talks about having a constant vigil. Your life needs to be in preparation for the return of Christ. That tells me a couple things. If you're here this morning, or you're watching by, by our live stream, and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, never asked Him to forgive you of your sins. you never asked Him to come into your life and change you and become the Lord of your life. Then right this moment, you're not prepared for that. But you know what? You can be. Just by asking Him to come into your life, surrendering control to Him, letting Him become the Lord of your life, you can, you can transition from being unprepared to being prepared. Transition from being lost to being saved. Transition from being dead to now being alive. And that's what he wants for you. And I would love to share with you, Brother Jeff and I will be here to share with you how you can invite Christ into your life. Let him become the Lord of your life. Maybe you're here today. You know that you're already prepared. You're actually longing for that day. Let me rephrase that. You and your heart are prepared. You and your desires are longing for it. But when you realize that there are those within your reach, those family members, those loved ones, those friends who are not ready, what are you doing to get them ready? What are you doing to prepare them? See, I, I don't think I'm prepared until I've reached every single person that I can reach. My family, my friends, my, my neighbors, everybody. And if we're just sitting by and watching them live their lives without Christ, then we're not prepared. We're not even loving them. Folks, we got an urgent message to share. Because is Jesus returning? Tells us it's certain. It's going to get us off guard. No surprise. It's going to separate the lost from the saved. But it's time to get prepared for that. So our Heavenly Father, we know that you are counting down the seconds as to when you say to your son, go get my children. God, I pray that Right now, there are those here in this room who are examining their own heart. 
Because that day when you turn to your son and say that could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be a thousand years from now. We know that. But it could also be this very hour. We don't know. But your word assures us that it is coming. It is imminent. So God, as those who are right now examining their own hearts, I pray that you are speaking to them. You are convicting them of their sin, drawing them to you because you love them so much and you desire to have a right relationship with you. So God, I pray that as we have this time of invitation, for those here today who do not know you as Lord and Savior, that today they surrender to you as we have our time of invitation. But Father, there are others that we know. There are those that we come in contact with. There are those that we see. There are complete strangers. And we need to be diligent about sharing the love that you have for them through the gospel. So God, I pray that you will challenge each and every one of us. Give us a burden for the laws and a passion for sharing Christ with those around us. So that we can have this whole world prepared for your return. God, you are mighty. And your word is true. We stand upon your inspired, inerrant, infallible word. And we know that as we read here from Matthew today, thus saith the Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand up here this morning today as God is speaking.